Good morning, everybody. Glad you can join us for worship this morning. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 95. It reads, Come, let us sing for joy for, to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Come, let us come, let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is our great God, the King above all gods. In his hands all the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Master, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Um, as I read this passage um, this morning, you know, I'm just reminded of the creation that God has created. You know, it says the mountains peaks belong to him, the seas belong to him, he has formed the dry land. And um, I'm just reminded of just the whole creation story and just how ultimate he is in all of that. And um, as we sing and worship this morning, I just want us to reflect about the majesty of God, you know, what has God done to show himself to us and reveal himself to us? And, you know, how are we supposed to respond to that greatness and majesty? So I just want us to reflect on those things as we worship this morning. So with that in mind, um, let's pray. <clears throat> um, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time to pray and this time to just reflect on your majesty, Lord, and just your creation. And I just pray that you be with us this morning as we worship, as we sing, as we just meditate on this music. Um, may you just review yourself to us um, every day, every moment, and allow us to just be able to respond to you in the right manner, Lord. Um, just allow us to worship this morning and just be with us. Yeah, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, you are a waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper.
one with one desire we come that you will reign that you will reign in us we're offering up our lives one living sacrifice that you will reign that you will reign in us oh great and mighty one Creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified. from sea and sky, from the rivers to the mountain tops, we hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified. altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody, every human heart is be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Christ be 
church. Thank you for coming to join us today to worship God together, to hear his word, to sing his praises together. This morning for our congregational prayer requests, we're going to be lifting up one of the missionaries that we support. Every month we have the opportunity to be able to pray for one of our missionaries, and this month we're going to be praying for Beth Bryson. As you can see in the slide here, Beth Bryson works for Wycliffe Bible Translators, who help people around the world translate the Bible into the languages of unreached people groups. Beth Bryson has been using her computational linguistic training at Wycliffe since 1999, and she, prays, uh, she praises, the, uh, praises God for his protection of her parents during the pandemic. Pray that Beth's parents will continue to receive excellent care so that Beth will be able to continue her Bible translation work with Wycliffe from home. And she also praises God for making his word available to the language communities that she's serving in. The Wycliffe teams have completed the translations of the whole Bible for five Quechua languages in Peru. Keliko people in South Sudan have now, now have the translated version of the New Testament, and the Farmer Fellowships have just received story versions of Luke and Acts. Pray that there will be effective distribution and good reception of these books. Uh, this is really awesome to be able to hear the work that God is doing through Beth and through Wycliffe. So we're going to be lifting up um, them this morning. We're also going to be praying for the various school ministries that our church holds. For example, the Smart Kids Ministries and the summer school program that takes place in the Chinatown branch. We need wisdom for whether or not to continue, for um, considering the uh, various concerns if we do continue, so we're going to be lifting that up as well. We'll also be praying for the outreach teams that are continuing to reach out to the communities in Chinatown and furthermore. And lastly, we're also going to say a prayer for Sam Hong and his family. Sam Hong has, has recently passed away about a week ago, and he was one of the pillars at our church, um, one of the a faithful member who had been serving on the tech crew for a long time. So we're praying for Andrew and Curtis, who are members of our church, and also their sister as well, as they prepare for the funeral arrangements. Would you bow your heads with me as we lift up these things to God together? Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are and all that you've done for us. We thank you, God, again, for the opportunity for us to come to you, which is only possible because you, in your grace, have sent Christ to redeem us and to reconcile us to you, Lord. We thank you, again, for such a great relationship we can have with you, allowing us to call you our Father and you to call us your children. Lord, we thank you for the mission that you have placed your church in and you have given to your believers. We thank you, God, for Beth Bryson and for the opportunity for us to be able to support her and the Wycliffe Ministries. We thank you, God, for all that they are doing, bringing your word and the good news of your word to people who do not have your Bible in their own heart languages. We continue to pray for Beth Bryson and her ministry. We continue to pray that Beth Bryson will be able to continue her work from home and that you would keep her parents safe. We also continue to pray for the work that's done in the various languages in Peru and in South Sudan. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to spread your good news to uh, all the world, Lord, so that many, many people can hear that you love them and that you have sent Jesus Christ to be their Savior. We also want to pray, God, for the various school ministries that our church produces, Lord. Each and every year we have the opportunity to reach out to so many different kids, but this year is thrown into a lot of flux because of the pandemic situation. We pray, God, for your wisdom for all the leaders who are running these ministries. We pray, God, for your will to be done. We pray, Lord, that if you desire for this ministry to continue, that you would give the strength and wisdom for how to uphold it. And Lord, help us to be willing, if you so call us, to, um, 
to not have these ministries if the if health requires it. But Lord, we just want to do everything for your glory and your name, Lord. So would you please guide these ministries? We also pray, God, for the outreach ministries. And pray, Lord, that you would be guiding our brothers and sisters who reach out to those in the Chinatown area and those who are reaching out to um, to the Daily City area, those who are doing outreach, God. We pray that you would continue to give them strength and wisdom for the ministries they are doing. Lord, we also lift up Sam Hong and his family. God, we are so thankful for this brother whom you had placed in our lives, who you have used for his many years at Cumberland Church. And we pray, God, for his family. We pray that your presence would be felt among them, that they would know your comfort and that they would know your promise, Lord, that you had given to Sam to keep him and protect him, Lord, and that now that he is resting in your presence, Lord, receiving the prize for the race that he has run. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with the family as they make their funeral arrangements and uh, that we as a church family would mourn with them as they mourn as well. Lastly, Lord, we turn to your word and pray, God, that you would make our hearts open to hearing you, Lord, that you would speak through me, that you would be the one who speaks to your people. We thank you, God, for again for this opportunity to hear you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning our scripture comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Hear the word of God as it is written in 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run, that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is the word of God. I want to ask you a question this morning. What is the one thing that you would say that you have worked for hardest in your life? What is the one thing that you feel like you have worked the hardest for in your life? And why did you work so hard for it? Uh, for me, probably the thing that I feel like I've worked hardest at in my life was probably my time during seminary or Bible school. I spent a good three and a half, almost four years down in San Diego, well, after graduating um, from undergrad, and it turned out to be much more rigorous than I could have imagined. I was learning Greek and Hebrew, I was learning theology, and I was reading hundreds of pages nearly every single day for my homework. Uh, in addition, I need to write lots and lots of papers. Uh, at that time, 10-page papers would be, uh, would be um, le considered l getting off easy from your professors. In fact, you know, the longest papers I had to write were probably around like 40, 40 pages or so. And on top of that, during that time, I was also interning at the San Diego church I was at there, helping with both the young adult ministries and then later the college ministries. And not to mention also that at the time I had just begun a long distance relationship with a young woman named Karina who I would eventually marry. But all around that time, it was, it was completely chaotic. There were all sorts of different responsibilities pulling at me. And that time in my life was definitely the busiest in the time where I was very, very stressful. I was very, very stressed out. Um, but I remember looking forward to that graduation day. And that, actually a very bright, beautiful, sunny day where, along with my classmates, we celebrated the end of our program and we were commissioned to go forth to bring God's word to the respective churches that God would bring us to. And by God's grace, he brought me back to Cumberland. And all that hard work that was placed in there was completely worth it. Completely worth it to be able to say, not just that I've finished through the program, but for God to equip me to allow me to do the ministry where I'm at right now. God had brought me through that hard work and it was worth it looking forward to the prize that I was, uh, I was anticipating. For you, what, would, what did you work hard at? And why did you work so hard at it? Well, more than likely, you, what you were working hard at, there was probably an end goal for you to reach that you would once in a while need to remind yourself of. Maybe some of us are talking about school programs, like myself. 
maybe some of us were putting together a party that took a lot of coordination or another program or maybe it's the work that you guys are working at. Whatever you might be, all of us have worked hard at something in our life that we wanted to see the end goal of. And looking forward to the end goal, what makes the effort that we pour into worth it is finally being able to get to the end goal and being able to see the result of everything that we've put our hard work into. Now, you might be surprised that the Bible also describes the Christian life as a lot of hard work. Um, oftentimes, the Christian life can be challenging and also can be very laborious. Oftentimes, we're telling other people about Christianity, and when we talk about it ourselves, we tend to shy away from the reality that the Bible talks about quite often, actually, which is the cost of following Christ. And that is, that sometimes, in the life that we have as we live for Christ, sometimes it'll come with great pain and great cost. But, brothers and sisters, we still have a way for us to be able to say that even though the Christian life can be really, really challenging, it is still the greatest news and the best news ever. How is that possible? And here's why. Um, as Paul writes in the passage that we are talking about today, the Christian life is filled with great effort but it is also containing the greatest reward at the end of the finish line. He actually turns to sports for an example of something that might be difficult for us when we work at it, but also gives a worthwhile prize as we work toward it. The two sports that Paul turns to in his day and age is the sport of foot racing, or just running and racing, and also of boxing. These two sports were very popular entertainment sports back in the Greco-Roman Empire. People would do these sports professionally, and in each sport it would require rigorous training and, um, and would require a lot of time that people would put into in order for them to compete and if they wanted to win the prize at the end of it. Now, as we dive into our passage, we will see that Paul describes a Christian life as like an athletic competition. It is like an athletic competition in that it, one, holds a prize, two, it requires focus, and number three, it also requires perseverance. Now, Paul writes verse 24 explaining why he goes all out in his ministry. He writes, um, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Now here, Paul is referencing these professional competitions uh, where people would race in the stadiums or box in the stadiums. And at the end, only one person, the one who worked the hardest, the one who would give it his all and come out at the end of the finish line and, and at the end of the competition, only they would receive the prize. And back then, there would be no first place, uh, be no second place or third place. There was only first place. And you know, um, in this way, Paul is also describing to us, to the Corinthians, and also to us, that we are to keep our eyes on the prize. And I believe that as we keep our eyes on the prize, that we will be able to live our lives fullest and to the fullest for the glory of God. Now, before we get into talking about the prize, though, um, I want us to briefly remember about the race that we are running in. Now, what does it mean to run in the Christian life? If you call yourself a Christian, what is this race that Paul is talking about? Well, to run in the Christian life means to spend your life, your time, your energy, your money, your resources, the, your relationships, use it all for the goal of bringing glory to God, our Creator, and our Savior. Now, reflect on this, for example. If you are a Christian this morning, when you ask Jesus Christ into your life to forgive you and to be your Lord, when you asked him to forgive you, and he forgave you, and he justified you by Christ's, ri Christ's righteousness and Christ's work, why did you not immediately go to heaven? Why does God 
choose to allow us to remain on the earth instead of immediately bringing us up to heaven after we are forgiven. If we are forgiven, uh, if being forgiven is the only goal in being a Christian, then we might as well have gone straight up to heaven after we have been uh, justified. However, um, that is turns out, as the Bible says, is not the goal that we live in life. The reason why God is giving us more time and more uh, more time here on earth is because he desires for us to use our life for his glory. The cliche is true that God is not finished with you yet. Uh, well, God is finished when it comes to justifying you. Jesus said on the cross that it is finished. He has no more left to forgive, no more left to justify, no more left to expunge your sin with. But what God is not done with is in utilizing your life, as long as you have breath, is utilizing your life to glorify him in every single area of your life. So Paul tells us the manner in which we should run. When he says, run so that you may obtain the prize. Now, Paul's emphasis here is not to get Christians to start looking at each other as competitors in the Christian life. He doesn't want each other to try to one-up each other in spiritual capital or anything like that. But his emphasis here is the effort and the strength that it takes to get to the end of the Christian life victorious. He wants us to give it our all. He wants us to give it our all as if we are trying to reach that first place. And the fact is that no one can get first place by jogging. The Christian life isn't just about surviving until God brings us till we die and we get to go to heaven. That is jogging mentality. No, the race that we are running is meant to be run with our very best, meant to be run with all our strength and all our effort until we cross that finish line to meet God where we can say that we've given it our all. And Paul gives it his all. Paul gives it his all. In fact, the, the section that we are looking at this morning is in direct response to what he said um, just a paragraph before it. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we read that Paul was passionately considering himself a slave to others. He says in verses 22 to 23 of chapter 9 that I have become all things to all people that by all means I may save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul here is working so, so hard for the glory of God. And why is he working so hard? Why is Paul putting in so much effort? It's because he wants to make himself worthy of the prize that he would receive at the end of his life. Let's take a look at the prize that God is promising us at the end of the Christian life race. Now, Paul continues in verse 25 by saying, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. You see, in ancient Greece, uh, when someone won a foot race or a boxing ring, um, they would be presented with an olive wreath. And that olive wreath would be called a crown. Not a gold crown, but a leafy crown. Um, that would be the prize for being the winning competitor. The crown represented victory and fame and honor. It was, came about because, based off the mythology of the Greek god Apollos, who was the god of victory and fame, and he too would wear a leafy wreath on his head. And that came about when you know competitors would win, they would get these wreaths. For them, it was a symbol of honor and respect that was bestowed upon an athlete. And it was essentially the gold medal for a, you know, equivalent to the gold medal of our Olympics today. Now, Paul is pointing out that the Greeks trained long and hard to compete for a compostable headband. Uh, but of course, you know, they, they also received honor and victory honor, right, in their victory, they sometimes had plaques written with their names on it. They also had um, statues sometimes. But here Paul is saying that even the honor that the Greeks 
that the Greek runners receive will also fade and die. And what is being promised in the Christian life will last even longer than when uh, with a gold wreath, even longer than an olive wreath, and even longer than a gold crown. What is the prize that Paul is talking about for the Christians? Well, the crown that Paul is talking about here can be understood in three different ways. One of the first ways that Paul can be understood in talking about the prize for the Christian life is, number one, getting to experience salvation and the presence of God. Now, at church, we talk about heaven so often, and even in the world around us, we could talk about heaven as if it's a place that's very peaceful, but probably really boring, is the way that we think about it. It's full of clouds, it's soft, it's nice, everybody's wearing white, and there's gold streets and everything like that, and you know, some of that's true. But let me remind us that heaven, brothers and sisters, will not be boring. Heaven will be the very opposite of boring. John Piper once put it this way, that what is the point? Who cares if you live forever if you're going to be bored forever? The fact is that eternal life will be good and eternally and utmostly good. The word enjoyable comes to my mind, but even that word doesn't capture all of the emotions that will come into play and all the realities that will be when we will experience our salvation of coming into the presence of God. It will be a mix of it will be a, a mix of awe gratitude and being overwhelmed and rest and this kind of joy will be like none other that we will have ever experienced here on earth. When I was in San Diego, um, I used to take a break from my studies by going out to the cliffs and that and these cliffs overlooked the ocean. Looking out at the waves as they crashed upon the shore and the vastness of the blue ocean that went way beyond my peripheral vision, um, I would just be overwhelmed with the sense of awe and smallness that I was, this recognition of how small I was. And I think that there was a small fleeting feeling of what it will be like in the eternal presence of God. This, not just peace and rest, but also this overwhelming feeling of awe. The book of Revelation talks about the splendor of the awesomeness of being in the presence of God. These powerful angelic beings being so floored by being in God's very presence that day and night they are crying out about how awesome and how majestic God is. And that is almost a scary picture, but also a, a picture of how amazing and how glorious it will be to be in his presence one day. Not only that, but the, the reality of being in his presence, this awesome presence, will be coupled with the reality of knowing that the king that sits on the throne welcomes you as not just a servant, but as his beloved son or daughter. And it's that overwhelming feeling that you didn't even deserve this title, but God the Father gave it to you by grace. And we will get to spend our eternal days in this overwhelming presence and love of God. You know, Ephesians 1 describes our salvation as the gleaming treasures that come as an inheritance of being God's children. And take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 19, as, as Paul describes it, as he prays for the Ephesians that the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of, the, of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. I love that description, this immeasurable greatness that is coming our way, the riches, this overflowing riches that God has coming our way. 
<laughs> so right by the cliffs that I used to go out to rest by, there would also be these huge, enormous mansions. These huge homes that apparently some people lived in. They would have these really big, awesome windows. They would have porches made of marble that look out to the ocean. These roofs that were just so huge and really beautifully sculpted together. And I think rumor had it that it was the um, it was owned by the Ralph's CEO and also the CEO of Food for Less. <clears throat> but I can imagine, I can imagine God wanting us to go to these homes, to be able to look at them, and for God to say to us, my child, don't think so small. Don't you think, don't think so small. What I have in store for you in your salvation and in my presence will be billions and billions times greater than these so-called mansions that you see here. For our brothers and sisters, the brothers and sisters who have known Jesus Christ, put their faith in him and have reached the end of their days, they are now in the presence of God, in the amazing, awesome presence of God, receiving the riches that he, has, that he has promised them. And I know, I know that they are enjoying them to the very utmost of their souls. Well, the second way that we can understand this crown that Paul is talking about is understanding it as we receiving the affirmation of having given God all the glory. Much like the leafy crown that the competitor, that the Greek competitors received, pointed to the affirmation that they were receiving from their peers, the crown that Paul is talking about is, is talking about the affirmation that we will receive at the end of the race. But even greater, the affirmation is not going to be from our fellow human beings. That's not even going to be worth it. Even greater will be the affirmation that comes from our Father and our King, the one for whom we lived for our entire life. What we will have to look forward to at the end of our long, hard life is being able to come home, welcomed by the Father as He looks us in the eye, takes us by the hand, and pulls us close and says, My son, my daughter, you did a great job. Come and enjoy rest with me. You know, during Jesus' ministry, he gave a parable speaking about the end times or the time that would come to an end, where, uh, where in this parable, how God will approach his servants. Um, the parable describes a master giving different servants different amounts of money to invest. And to those who were faithful with what they have, this is what the master said to him in Matthew chapter 25, verse 23, his master said to him, the servant, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. What a welcome. This is a small description of what it will be like when we come through the gates of heaven to come be received by Christ and the Father himself, where we will be received. You know, the fact is that every single person longs for some kind of affirmation, longs to know that the work that they do, that what they are passionate about is something that they are good at. We love to hear the affirmation of other people saying, wow, you are really good at the sport that you do. Or wow, that piece of art that you made, that's beautiful. And you know what? To the end of our life, we will also receive with an infinitely greater satisfaction the affirmation of God saying, come, well done, well done. Come and rest. You have invested your life and all of your life to my glory. Congratulations, you've made it home. <laughs> so, brothers and sisters, for every encouraging word, for every dime that we have given to honor him, for every minute that we spend to, uh, to lift up a brother or sister or somebody who doesn't know him, God is not indifferent to these actions that we are taking. God is paying attention. He is looking on. He is keeping track. And he wants us to know that he will reward us and for restoring our time, our resources, our energy, our words 
well. He desires for us to know that we will be rewarded at the end of our Christian life for the time and effort we have given to his glory and his name. Do we look forward to hearing God's voice directly saying to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, Paul is setting forth the prize of the Christian life to keep his brothers and sisters on track. In order for them to get at the finish line, it requires them to regularly come back to focus, to focus on the goal and prize. He continues on, he continues on in verse 26, writing, So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. <laughs> Paul's giving a funny picture here. He's saying it's, it's like a picture of like a track meet where you're looking on from the stadium and you see three people in this track meet running as hard as they can straight down the line towards the finish line. And at the back, at the very back, you see this guy who's just kind of like wobbling around in the back there, running in, in squiggles and circles, not going directly towards the finish line. And Paul's like, yo, I'm not like this guy. No, I'm nothing like this guy because I have, I have a prize I'm going to win. I have a goal that I'm running towards and nothing is going to distract me from receiving that prize. And he's also saying that he's like a boxer who knows that he has to train to be strong. Like he knows that his opponent is not going to be just air. He's like, yeah, yeah, that, I won, I won, right? Like. A boxer is going to box actual people, right? Not just the air. And so if I was about to box, you know, one of our members who apparently is actually very, very good at boxing, um, there's no way I would win unless I train and get stronger. And even then I might not win because this brother is probably really strong. Um, the, but Paul is saying that in order for him to gain the prize, He's going to have to be focused. He's going to have to train. And he's going to have to train hard in order for him to get the prize. Paul's eyes are focused on the prize. And it causes him to hone his strength towards the task of ministry. Now Paul is telling us, keep your eyes focused on the prize that God is promising you. Keeping our eyes on the prize has, a pur has the purpose of motivating us and keeping us going, especially when things are rough. Because if we are able to not just put our eyes on the distractions, but keep our eyes fixed on what we are aiming toward, it serves, in, it serves us in multiple ways. Number one, it reminds us that our labor is not in vain. Keeping our eyes on the reward that God will bring us reminds us that the hard work that we're putting in is going to something. That we will not be, uh, that we will not be put to shame. That we will that because our work was to nothing, but rather it's to a true promise that God will provide. And not only that, but keeping our eyes on the prize reminds us that we have been given time and energy to spend in order to glorify God. You know, sometimes things in life can distract us from the prize. I, I love the movie Up, and one of my favorite. Uh, one of my favorite characters from the movie Up is the dog, Doug. Doug is this really cute, really, really cute golden retriever who is, becomes a companion to some of the main characters. And one of the main characteristics of Doug, though, is that once in a while, he would think, he would think that he hears a squirrel and goes, Squirrel! And it comes back to what he was doing. <laughs> um... I think that's often a good description of what we can be like sometimes. You know, sometimes we can have our eyes focused on the prize, focused on the goal at hand, but sometimes squirrels will run into our view and get us distracted. And at worst, what, would, what might happen is that we will chase after these squirrels and run after them, forgetting what we were running after in the very first place. Well, in our Christian life, we will face many different distractions and also many struggles and temptations that will cause us to take our eyes off of the prize that God is sending before us and calling us to want to call it quits. Um, our, uh, our focus on the prize requires us 
to continue to strive hard after what God is calling us towards. Every Christian in their life will experience temptation to call to take our eyes off of the prize. Um, one way might be through envy. We might envy what non-Christians have. We might envy what the, what the world might offer, thinking that if I were not a Christian, I might be able to enjoy X, Y, and Z. That being a Christian doesn't allow me to enjoy. And being so sacrificial for the kingdom of God, it's just, you know, there, there's so many other things I'd rather spend my time and my money for instead of for God's glory. You know, we can often be like that, where we might be distracted by these other things. But like Esau, we would be giving up an entire inheritance for something as simple as like a bowl of soup, is what Esau did. That's one way we can be distracted, is by envying the lifestyle and successes of other people. But another subtle way that we can be distracted and be tempted to take our eyes off of the prize is by simply being apathetic, growing slowly apathetic by losing vision of the prize at hand. Where life itself can seem really dreary and really burdensome. <laughs> Raise your hand at home if you, if you can relate to something like this. Where I am a Christian, I know that God has much ahead of me, but honestly, day after day, it just kind of wears on me. There is too many tasks to do at my work. There is too much homework to take care at school. Life is too boring being indoors and being in, in, in this pandemic. Days, day in and day out, time seems cyclical and nothing seems to be moving forward. And sometimes everything that you experience in your day-to-day -day rhythm can feel like that's all there really is. And mentally, we might believe, we might know that God has promised something, but if we're honest with ourselves, the worries and the cares of life can feel more real to us than the promises of God. And truth be told, this past week, I was recognizing in myself that I really struggle with focus and lack of self-discipline. And as I was examining my own life and preparing for the sermon, I was asking myself, is what I struggle with is, is my struggle of being focused, that is, in putting my time and effort to doing God's work. Is my struggle with staying focused really because I have a lack of willpower and a lack of self-control? Or could it be that rather I have a lack of focus? That is, a lack of focus on the prize that God has before me. Because I realize that if I truly believe, if I truly believe that God is counting the time and counting the energy that I am spending for his glory as something worthwhile and something that he will reward me for, then why would I not pour all of my time into it? Why would I not be just completely focused to the task at hand of doing his ministry, of giving him all that glory? You know, I realize that our actions, our actions can be, uh, can reflect what we truly believe. And sometimes for us, if we feel apathetic and our lives feel like they're going in and out, but we don't remember the glory of God, maybe a lack of focus on the glory of God and lack of focus on the prize that he's holding out before us could be a reason why we are not striving hard after the glory of God. So how about you and me? How about you and me? Do we truly, truly have a focus on his glory and on the prize he has set before us? Well, there are two steps here in order for us to be able to persevere and to be able to strive hard after him. Step one is to believe. Examine yourself and ask yourself, do I really believe that God is going to reward me for the time and the money and the effort that I pour into his name and his glory. And if you truly do believe that, then remember it and put your focus on it so that it would continue to give you motivation in order to glorify him in whatever context you are. Whether you're at school, whether you're at home with your family, whether whatever it might be, and whatever God might be calling you to, let God use you for his glory. Now, the strength of our focus, 
The strength of the focus that we have on the prize at hand will lead then into the strength of our perseverance. The strength of our perseverance that we will run in this race. Perseverance requires us keeping our focus on God. And keeping our focus on God requires us also to act upon our focus on God. Paul will explain this um, very clearly when he gets to verse 26 to 27. He says, So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one being the heir. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, Paul's talking about his own Christian race that he's running. He's talking about how at the end of his life, he doesn't want to say that he ran this and he ran halfway really hard. He was focused, and then he lost focus. And he gave up his ministry. And he decided to live his life for his own glory. And because what good would it be if you ran half the way but never finished? That is, and that kind of perseverance requires self discipline. It requires the self-discipline of rejecting the reasons to, uh, to fall into temptation. It requires self-discipline to keep our minds and keep our, uh, keep our heads, our hearts focused on God. How do we do that? Well, we can do that by the regular self-discipline of, of spending time with God on the regular. We can also do this by continuing to pray to God whenever we struggle with temptation. Whenever we are wrestling with temptation that calls us away from doing what is what would give God glory, let us remember to persevere by keeping our eyes focused on God. And the fact of the need for perseverance persists today as strong as ever. Because the world we're living in is not going to get easier in respect to following Christ. The, the truth is that year by year, we are, uh, it is going to get harder and harder to truly live as a Christian. Even nowadays, we're starting to recognize that the normative views of sexuality is very divergent from what the Bible has to say, what God has to say about our bodies and about sex. We also recognize that in our culture, there's a very strong thing called cancel culture, where if you disagree with somebody, you will be automatically canceled, where you will be put out and no, and where people will say, don't listen to them or her, and that none of their opinions are valid any longer. We also live in a day and age where postmodernism, that is a, uh, the view of truth, is that there is no real truth. And that stands in complete opposition to what the Bible says. The Bible says that there is a truth and that we must live by this truth lest we be, lest we, that we perish. We live in a self-oriented culture, a culture that, that, that justifies all of our decisions because of our emotions. And, you know, ultimately Christians in our culture nowadays don't have a very good view in general. The Christian life. The Christian life is difficult to persevere in. And the labor of the Christian life is a reality that, honestly, we, we have to get to talk about more often and be honest with ourselves more about today, now more than ever. The Christian life is difficult to stay in. So how will we stay in it in light of the many temptations, in light of the many challenges that come our way? Well, I want to encourage us that when comes to Christian discipline, Christian self-discipline isn't just about pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps, isn't just about mustering up your own strength to be a good person. But here's the paradox of the Christian faith, that the Christian faith, that the Christian life requires great effort, but it is not by great effort that we are saved. But rather, the great effort is a gift that God gives us in order to receive good rewards from our great God. It is, it is paradoxical that we enter into this Christian life by not our strength, but by admitting our weakness and our fragility. Not by claiming strength, 
that it is in our weakness that God meets us and grants us strength. It is in our is in our failures and admitting our failures that God says, "I love you. I forgive you. Run hard because I love you." You know, perhaps it would help to show a couple of diagrams to explain what I mean. Now, oftentimes, our view of the relationship between our efforts and God rewards looks like this. We tend to focus a little bit much on our efforts and the rewards that God would grant us. Now, this is not an incorrect mentality, but it is an incomplete diagram, an incomplete mindset. And oftentimes, though, when we look at this incomplete mindset too much and we focus so much on our efforts that lead to God's rewards, it leads to the incorrect mindset that our efforts contribute then to our salvation. And that is not the good news of the gospel. That is, in fact, the bad news that we cannot have by any of our efforts receiving, be receiving God's rewards and or salvation. None of that could be true. But in fact, we need the whole picture. And the whole picture looks like this, that it is Christ's work and Christ's work alone that grants us our salvation, that grants us the inheritance that we will receive by God. And it is in our salvation that God grants us then more opportunities to bring, to, by our efforts, grant Him glory in the life that we have now. And in the efforts that we will give God, He will grant us rewards for our life lived on His behalf. Does this make sense? It may, that when we focus too much on the rewards, that we focus too much on our efforts leading to the rewards, um, we can get confused and think that our salvation is based on our works. But we always must, must, must return to the fact that we have been loved first by God. And that leads us to love God in return. And by God's grace, as we love Him in return, He rewards us for the love that, uh, for the love that we give Him in return. And so it ought to be that we always remind ourselves that the race that we are running, we fight the good fight by resting in Christ. And by resting in Christ, we are given the strength to do great things for his name and for his glory. By relying on God's strength instead of my own strength to run this race. So in a very real way, the crown that you and I are looking forward to and striving towards, we must remember that we receive that crown only because Jesus wore a crown, a very different crown, a crown of thorns that we deserved before on our behalf. And in that way, in his wearing that crown, that only that enables us to run the race where we can receive the crown. And not only that, but the affirmation that we look forward to, to hearing good and faithful servant, only comes because God's true good and faithful servant, his son, went to die on a cross for our sin and on our behalf. So, Christian self-discipline is about relying on what Christ has done for you and allowing what Christ has done for you to channel into our efforts to glorify him. So, brothers and sisters, let us keep our eyes focused on the cross and the empty grave. And as we see that Christ's work has bought our salvation, let the love and the gratitude that flows from that energize us to run this race well. And as we keep our eyes focused on the prize that God is holding out for us for running, for running this race well, we may run the race with strength and passion. Encourage each other, brothers and sisters, and hold on tight to the promise, because we will be home one day soon to receive the prize of God's salvation and glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much, God, for the prize that you are giving us as you have set us on this race and the opportunity to glorify you in every way in our life. And God, if we feel weak, 
in our energy and weak in our desire to glorify you. I pray, God, that you would give us perseverance. Please give us focus on the beauty of what you are offering us, Lord. Thank you, God, that you see all of the efforts that we produce for, our, uh, for your name and that you desire to reward us for it. And truth be told, these efforts are really coming from your strength, coming from your gospel itself. And I pray, Lord, that we would be able to look upon your gospel so that we might be able to run this race well. Help us to encourage each other. Help us to do it all for your glory. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, we thank you for joining us for our worship. And we hope that you are encouraged by God's word today. We just have a couple of announcements to close our worship with. We first want to announce our condolences, our church's condolences, to Sam Hong's family. Sam Hong was a faithful member of our Cumberland community and went home to be with the Lord on Saturday, June 20th, 2020. Please pray for Curtis and Andrew and their sister Terry as, and their family as they mourn this great loss. In lieu of flowers, you may honor Sam with donations to either, number one, the Alzheimer's Association, which Sam donated too often while his wife, Esther, was suffering from Alzheimer's, and or the American Diabetes Association. Uh, Sam also contributed to the American Diabetes Association because he himself suffered with diabetes for much of his life. So let us remember the family in prayer. And let us continue to give glory to God for all that Sam had done in his life and praise him for the rest that he is now receiving. A second announcement is that we have a graduation Sunday on July 19th. Um, there's a form that we want you guys to fill out in order for us to help prepare. This will be again for junior hires, high schoolers, college and grad school graduates. And we would love to recognize God's guidance in their lives. You can go to the link below for, to fill out the form or use your phone to scan the QR code. You have permission to pause the video now to, QR, to scan the QR code. Or you can email me for any questions you might have. We also have our English Sun Adult Sunday School this upcoming Tuesday. This bi-weekly Sunday School will take place at 8 p.m. on Zoom. Take a look in your emails for that Zoom link. And this week we're going to see how God sets apart his rescued people to reflect him and to bring glory to his name both back then and also now. If you have any questions, you can also email me at the email there. And so we actually have one last announcement, and we're going to start that announcement off with a short little video. Check it out. Hi everyone, Pastor Tim here. As you can see from the video, our kids are now in summer and some of them might have many things to do or some of them might be a little bit more bored at home. In any case, some of the children's ministry workers are hoping to pull together a team to be able to hold a children's fellowship for our elementary school kids in our church. And we realize that there is a need in our church 
for our kids to be able to interact with one another and to be able to build relationships that are surrounded with the love of God and around Jesus Christ. Even as adults, we realize that we need spiritual relationships in order to build our faith together. And this way, our kids are no different. Hopefully through once a week gatherings where kids can be able to play games together and to receive very short object lessons, maybe our kids will be able to grow spiritually this upcoming summer. However, we realize that this children's fellowship will not be possible without a dedicated team of volunteers who could be able to work together to be able to put this ministry together. And so we hope that some of you might be willing to be able to help in this capacity serving our kids on this team to put together a children's fellowship. If you're interested in helping meet this need, please email me in the email down below, and I hope that we can work together for the glory of God and for the spiritual growth of our kids together. Thanks for listening, and I hope that you guys can be able to email me soon. Take care. Well, as was mentioned, we are hoping to start together a children's fellowship. Again, this is going to be a weekly online gathering, and we are really looking for volunteers who can help fulfill this need for our elementary kids. If you do have any remote desire to volunteer in this ministry, please let me know at the email there. Well, thank you again for joining our worship. Um, let us end our time with the closing benediction coming from Jude, verse 24 to 25. Will you bow your heads with me? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Praise be to God. That is the prize we are looking forward to. Praise be to God. Have a great Sunday and have a great week. We look forward to you joining us again next week. Take care.